Uh, another thing to think about when we do these migrations is how are we going to tackle the content? Now, um, this is a really easy discussion when we think about documents. Um, I'm going to use the term DMS here, but essentially you have the content that's no longer relevant. Okay, well, we'll just leave that behind. And there is examples of this content within your SharePoint server environment. To lead is a remote first company based out of Canada. What makes a world-class Microsoft 365 internet and digital workplace? Um, I'm going to come back to this in a second, but it's an important one uh, that there is there is a path as well for leave behind uh, that I think people overuse. If we go to the move one, one of the things that we also see is that customers move that content online. Move is kind of a misnomer here. They copy it online and then they incrementally update it. And then when they're ready, they cut over it by making this read only doing a final incremental migration and then you know switch it over it's never really a move you don't delete the content over here until you're you know officially done your validation and you've cut over and you've done all these other motions first so but but it's like moving right so we essentially move it as is a lift and shift style approach then there's sort of this update um, this is a great example when we talk about pages so if we have classic pages or um, you know other kind of content like that we have new modern pages they have sectional layouts they have new web parts so we want to use those new experiences and that often means you know copy pasting but rewriting uh, the page layout right restructuring the page and rebuilding it um, and so that is more of an update process than a completely create new because those pages exist we're just kind of modernizing those pages and there are quite a few pages that you might want to target um, to have IT support in this process of doing that and then there are quite a few others that you would say are going to be updated but you would distribute to end user communities and things like that to do that upgrade that doesn't mean by the way you haven't moved those pages I'll come back to this it's okay to move them into classic versions online so that they're you know sitting beside each other and then when ready the modern page gets published and then they essentially archive or do something else with the the classic page so that it's you know no longer a conflict and then that improves the experience for everyone as well and it doesn't hold the business back so it is important not to try and own everything and control everything here there's there's definitely a room where you can you can stagger this and create new does happen for sure a great example of create new is when you create a new site which is in modern so you create a new modern kind of skeleton or or new modern enabled site and then what you do is you migrate the content from a classic site into the modern site in that example you're both creating new slash updating um, and then there's totally new ones that also come up so you may have uh, you've always had the desire to have a policy center or something like that but you never had that ia pattern uh, on-prem that information architecture pattern now we're going to establish that new one online so each of these are things that you have to think about when you do the migration and a lot of migration planning is essentially taking you know that subsite that site and saying what are we doing with it uh, of these options now I, I promised I'd come back to leave so I just want to add one more comment here it is always better to do this in the cloud. It's always better to transition the content into the cloud and then modernize it. I'm gonna use some examples for that later, but I wanna see much less on the leave category and much more in these other categories for most customers. It is okay though to leave some stuff if it's richly integrated with say ERP systems, like uh, if you have ERP integration with your SharePoint, that's a great example of something that you might wanna not wanna change because ERP probably has its own migration and upgrade project, which may often be years away from SharePoint. And so if SharePoint loads up quicker and gets you know, online faster, we might wanna leave this content uh, until that ERP solution has been modernized and then connect those two experiences as an example. So, so there's lots of good reasons for leave behind uh, for some some of these scenarios the less that's left behind the less your security footprint risks are if you're keeping that on that older SharePoint version or the less you need to kind of modernize on the SharePoint server side uh, as you kind of migrate forward to SharePoint server subscription edition all right the migration process is also something that people kind of make a mistake with what a lot of people think about when they think about the migration process is that it's a really simple flow and this is pretty accurate this is what it is right you identify you analyze you define the scope you evaluate the environment you go and prepare by the way the online environment uh, with like uh, you know skeleton sites that you're going to move migrate into you do like uh, assignment of roles like who's going to own validation etc for these different sites on migration you map out all those content all those sites all those permissions things like that you maybe clean it up you know you, you do all these stages but this last section over here where we talk about migrate validate and finalize in this section um, I think a lot of customers make a mistake where especially on the executive side where they think that it's just kind of a flow it's a straightforward process but this is actually um, a, a, a process that continues and continues and 
kind of cycles and cycles and cycles through. So, you know, the migration itself is more of a batched and cyclical process, whereas, you know, the assess, the plan, and the prepare work might be done up front. Um, so this is an important one. I'll come back to this, but here's a different way of thinking about it. A lot of times what could be visualized if someone understands this process is they say, okay, well, we'll just migrate everything, right, with different tiering or whatever. And then when it's all done, we'll do training and adoption and, and essentially we'll delete, archive, and cut over. Great. Um, the reality is that's not really how it works. You can do batch, batch, batch migration and a super cutover event, um, but the reality is what's actually happening in between these batches is you're probably doing like mini cutovers because you have to validate this batch before you move on to the next one. You have to review and understand what are the remediation steps within this batch. And so um, there's time that passes between these. So by the time you get to this node over here, if you're still having cut over, you essentially have to do another migration for batch one to update it all. So it's it's not as simple as saying, you know, we just have blah, 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 and then a cutover. The reality is you actually have pretty much every, all the work, all the investments done, you're just not reaping any rewards as you go through this. So option two that I'm showing here where you do a, a you know consistent cutover, and a batch, by the way, can be you know everything for a department, or it could be you know just one uh, particular collection of sites from a department. The reality is what, what the batches represent is up to you, but to have more continual cutover is always uh, a better satisfaction, uh, you know, better outcomes, better financial ROI, and certainly a much better cost modeling approach to a project like this than to go for the all or nothing cutover. So I just really don't encourage the second, this this initial option if you can avoid it. And um, you know, I think a lot of that comes from this idea that it's like a, a single flow with a single termination point. So I'll come back to that. One more thing to think about with these batches is each batch, you know, you have your own documentation models, but for sure, everyone's migration plans has three things. They have sort of the tracking of what are the batches that we're migrating, which could be a, a site collection, a number of site collections, a number of subsites. Again, it's it's up to you to define this me uh, model that you're going to use for migration. But then you have to track it. You know how how we migrated. Are we doing the essentially first pass uh, migration where you know the content hasn't been validated, or are we doing the final incremental push where now we are essentially setting it to read only in the source, and then we're in planning on cutover. When's that cutover? Uh, targeted for when it's going to be completed, all that stuff. So a lot of the migration planning is about really getting to this point where you really know how things are going to land and you have done testing to understand if these numbers and dates are realistic, right? Because um, a lot of customers also struggle with predicting how long it's going to take to migrate. You know, there's throttling, there's a lot of other things involved there. Um, you know, the most conservative estimate we hear is about five gigs an hour. Right, because you've your validation time, you know, if you have a heavily used Microsoft 365 instance and you're also doing the migration, but you can get much faster um, migration speeds than that. But you know, using that as a baseline, if you know you have two terabytes of content, you know, and you divide that by five um, gigs and then you look at you know, maybe 20 or 40 hour migration load weeks, um, that can give you a really quick sense of, of uh, communication that you can share back to say, hey, this is going to take you know weeks of effort to migrate. Uh, from a physics perspective, if we if we think of all these throttling and challenges we're going to go through, right, uh, starting and stopping the migrations, reviewing whether or not they function correctly, we want smaller batches, right, the smaller the better, right, to in increase uh, the speed of which we can resolve issues and things like that. So again, all of these things uh, combine together to inform, you know, the dates and the targets. The, the best thing you can do is to POC or pilot it yourself, get real data about how long it's taking to migrate, um, how long it takes to do the validation, and then position that as, you know, what, what you think the total time to migrate would be. If you don't have any of that, then use their super conservative number of five gigs an hour, because that should give you more than enough time to actually migrate the rest of it. All right. Um, some other things that are important about this kind of uh, flow of, of migrating and then validating, migrating, validating, is that um, from a solutions perspective, a lot of what I've been talking about has been content. I'm migrating files and libraries. I'm migrating lists. You know, I'm migrating pages. Um, I haven't really talked about solutions like InfoPath Forms, workflows, and things like that. Um, the model that I've described for migration, where we do batches and where we prioritize, you know, kind of based on, um, you know, the, the larger, who, who's more impacted by it, um, is still true here. And with solutions, one of the things we find is um, a lot of times what people will do is they'll hold the content related to a solution hostage. Uh, when they do the migration, they'll leave like the entire site collection, let's say, because it has a solution in it, um, instead of you know, and focus on all these easier ones, which is fine, but there's a, a missed opportunity there because that site might have a huge number of users, it might be really important, and so migrating everything but that solution 
might be the best possible scenario for you to start with because by migrating everything but that solution itself you know you can actually have um, people experience the new modern experience a large percentage of people and then you know just through a couple clicks on the left links or in the top nav or in a couple places they kind of jump back to that old experience it's also easier because in that old experience we don't have to update everything we just have to update a few of those pages you know that relate to that old experience so that there's a sense of cohesion for navigation um, another reason that we find this really powerful is you'd be surprised at how many customers um, we essentially migrate the content up into the cloud um, you know including even the content that relates to the processes and we essentially say hey this is like sort of a, a, a the draft state, right? The real, the core data is over here. Um, but then it, there's all these discussions about, well, maybe we just do a really simple sync model for now in between the two. Well, we already have the migration tooling. It's not that difficult to do as a temporary solution. And then what you end up finding is that, you know, the understanding of uh, Power Automate and understanding of how to use, you know, the rules-based uh, models within lists and libraries and other things increases. And so uh, we've been amazed at how many business units themselves have actually rebuilt or started rebuilding these processes and these uh, solutions themselves in the online environment as they enrich their own understanding. And then that essentially means that the migration um, timeline for the solution extreme, is extremely accelerated because essentially the business has either contributed heavily to it or is even actually resolved it. And so they don't need this legacy environment anymore. And then that's one last thing that IT had to kind of lead and own. So there are some really interesting opportunities here where if you enable the business with the right kind of education and support around Power Platform especially, um, you'll actually find uh, that the business uh, does actually take care of some of these challenges without IT spend associated with it, which is a pretty big win in our books. So uh, as mentioned, um, there's, a, there's a dense 50 minutes of content here. I'm always a big fan of giving you guys too much information and insight. So, um, you know, do expect, you know, to kind of drink from the fire hose. And with that, let me just quickly describe, you know, why I'm here and why I'm talking to you about this particular topic area. 